Welcome to Wind and Fire. I'm Gene Packwood, Chairman of Anglican Renewal Ministries Canada, and uh, I'm speaking to you from Saskatchewan, land of living skies. In this episode, we're going to hear from Roderick Gilbert, who is a gifted evangelist, church planter, and disciple maker from India. And when he first came to faith, he developed a real hunger to have other people come to saving faith in Jesus. So he copied the methods of other evangelists of the time, but found that he wasn't getting any results. He thought that something must have been missing. Roderick takes up the story from there. About an year passed, and again, the desperation on my heart began to get built up because people were not getting saved and nothing was happening. Nothing miraculous was happening. Nothing uh, divine was happening. It was just us working hard. So, so I began to pray, God, can you, uh, I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Please fill me with the Holy Spirit. I need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I, need, I want to speak in tongues and nothing happened. Nothing happened. Mm. So one day, uh, our team was staying in a campus and there was a wilderness. Uh, I walked with my Bible into the wilderness and uh, I began to pray. I would say, God, would you please fill me with the Holy Spirit? I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. My expectations were uh, beams of light uh, uh, coming through uh, from the horizon and uh, something dramatic would happen and I would see some fire or something. I would have vision or uh, the angels would sing around or whatever. Something uh, uh, divine is going to happen and I'm going to speak a language that I don't know. Uh, so, uh, But nothing was happening. It was just me and that bush. And uh, I became desperate. I began, Lord, will you please fill me with the Holy Spirit. And uh, nothing was coming. Uh, and uh, uh, not too much further than that, I was weeping and crying. I was in sweat and puzzled. I became very worried also while I prayed, Lord, am I, am I really saved? <laughs> am I really born again? <clears throat> Uh, uh, then all of a sudden I, I found myself speaking in the language of something. I was just dabbling. Uh, I went on doing that, but I was liking it very much. It was wonderful, wonderful experience, but nothing divine uh, went on. So, uh, but I spent all my day praying in tongues in that wilderness, uh, believing that I was uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. And very soon we were called in our base and uh, I was the native uh, young guy. So I spoke the native language and uh, I had some grip on English as well. So I could interpret from English to Hindi and uh, a seminar was going to uh, take place. And uh, we had one of our international executive directors coming and visit us. So he was going to take the seminar. Uh, he was going to give the seminar, I would say. And I was supposed to interpret him. So my leaders put me to uh, talk with him, spend time with him so I can get acclimated with his accent and vocabulary, whatever. And uh, when I saw him, he was an elderly man, gray hairs, and I was in my late teens. Sir, I have a good news to tell you. I was very, very, very excited. Good news? What? Yes, sir, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. You got filled with what? Sir, I spoke in tongues. All day I spoke in tongues. You spoke in what? I think you need some good Bible study. Yes, sir, I need some good Bible study. Okay. He comes back to the United States and enrolls me and three others, four of us, in a correspondence course from Moody Bible Institute. And uh, it was a series of 18 courses. We were so hungry and thirsty. I was usually an average student, but I scored 95% and above because we were so hungry and thirsty. Read over study, read over study, digest, just pick everything and soak in everything and soak in, memorize, take notes, write more notes. Work hard, day and night, and still go preach. 
And very soon I realized, oh, the filling of Holy Spirit, baptism, speaking in tongues is all nonsense. All those gifts have ceased. And uh, it's all the word of God and that's it. Canonial uh, scriptures, nothing else. And I became very, very strong believer in, of conservative faith. And I began to walk against the life of fullness with the Holy Spirit, anointing, baptism, Holy Spirit, gifts. <clears throat> and I, I began to commit the sin of blasphemy of Holy Spirit to my extreme strength. I would seek every single opportunity to find a man, a Pentecostal man, confront him, ask him questions, pin him to the wall and defeat him. It was such a fun thing to do. I loved doing it. And to my surprise, I saw they had very little root. Uh, they could not go um, beyond a certain uh, depth. And uh, I began to commit the sin to my extreme ability. Blaspheming against the Holy Spirit finding more points, more notes to prove against all this. But the burden to see masses roll into the kingdom never left my heart. When I would come to my bed, I would be so desperate, so desperate. No souls were saved. No souls were saved. There was no result. I was working hard Fasting, praying, trying to be obedient to every single word that would come. Trying to be honest as much as honest as possible. But nothing was happening. Would work hard, preach all day, preach on the streets. Walk holy as much as possible. But no soul was getting saved. The desperation on my heart began to mount up. I even wanted to quit the ministry. As a youngster, I was so badly burnt out. Badly burnt out. I'm crying and praying, being obedient to the word of God. And working hard. Why souls are not being saved? Everything was happening. My leaders were so happy with me. Every other time, my... my uh, responsibilities were raised. I was giving a higher place in leadership, which was not what I was seeking for. I was seeking to see, I, I wanted to see the day when the souls would roll into the kingdom, which was not happening. Nobody was believing in Christ. I was, uh, I was engaging people in discussion. One day I entered in discussion with a guy in his house while I was evangelizing. And I spent nine hours eyeball to eyeball. And uh, I defeated him, so to say, in every single turn. And in the end, he says, I don't believe what you say. What? He has no question left unanswered. Still would not believe. What will it take for people to believe in Christ as the Lord and Savior? And that uh, the burden was not leaving my heart. The passion was not leaving my heart. I was so much hard Pressed, but no soul was being saved. Few years went by, and by 1990, I gave up. Gave up the fight against the Holy Spirit. Few things happened. I used to take lots of fasting already. This time, I got enrolled in another course that was International Correspondence Institute's uh, uh, College Division degree program. I enrolled myself into the program and they uh, gave me book of acts to study with commentaries and everything, that book. And I began to, uh, I found a place. I took 21 days fasting. I was only drinking water and uh, studying and praying and studying. Most of the time I was on my knees crying, weeping and crying. When weeping would stop, I would again begin to study study, study. And as soon as there would be uh, a, a surge, I would just begin to pray. Lord, I love you. 
I failed you all these years. I don't know. But this study uh, answered every question that I would have against the life of walking in Holy Spirit. And uh, by this time, I was also leading a, a huge campaign. I had 120 young guys that I was managing for evangelism. I was still preaching a lot, but uh, this time I moved the campaign to the next uh, region. And uh, I was trying to look for accommodation. So visiting pastors. So I ended up visiting a pastor, an old man, a holy saint, never married. Very, very strong, spirit-filled man. He was a four square church pastor, very deep in the word, very deep in the spirit. Uh, a, a deep, deep man that was given to prayer all the time, all the time. He was, he was fasting for 40 days, at least three times a year. And uh, I asked him, sir, uh, can I have some uh, accommodation that you are not using for a couple of months so we can keep our teams for evangelism? He said, entire campus is yours. We have nothing going on. And you can use the entire building, entire campus. So I made that place as my uh, temporary base to operate in that region. We got some truckloads of literature, got filled in those rooms. And uh, I made a small training center there. Uh, I would train new recruits and send them in the fields uh, and often would call the leaders back for review and everything. But he, he was such a powerful man. He began to tell many of his testimonies. He said, one day we were praying in a house we were a couple of dozen people. We were fasting and praying in a house. And we spent uh, a few days. And one afternoon, we heard the noise of people. So we opened the window and see entire neighborhood surrounding our building with water in their buckets. And what happened? We saw the whole building under fire. So we came to fight the fire. But when we peeked through the um, cracks of window, we saw Jesus walking among you, and uh, we have such we, we we have such a strong conviction on our heart. We are sinners, so he preached to them, and they were all saved. In one event, uh, people were opposing him badly, so he used to conduct a healing service every Friday evening. A, a, a couple of uh, young guys, they had one of them act blind and they brought him and had him seated in front row. And the plan was he would ask the pastor to pray for healing. And when he would pray, he would not open his eyes. So they would say, you could not heal him. So they will uh, hit him. That was the plan. So they held him by arms and brought him and had him sit. And the pastor had no idea. So as service went on, prayers and worship, then he began to preach. While he was preaching, this guy, he wanted to see something. And when he tried to see something, he literally could not see because he turned blind. He was absolutely all fine young guy. And suddenly he, 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 he had turned blind. He turned blind. He was so desperate. He said, oh, I'm blind. He said, not now. Not now. Not yet. No, no, no. No, guys, I'm blind. So they said he is he is going ahead of time. He, he is doing it too soon. No, no, this is not the time. This is not the time. Many pray. No, no, no. I'm blind. He is for sir. I'm blind. I'm blind. He is, What's going on? So then he shouted out loud. He said, Sir, these are my friends that brought me here. I was acting blind and would have you pray and not be healed. So we would hit you. But now I have literally turned blind. I can't see anything. He said, really? Okay. Do you want to repent? Yes, sir, of course I repent. He just knelt down and said, oh, I'm so sorry. He was repenting and repenting. He came forward, laid hands on his head. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Be healed. Open eyes. His eyes were open. And uh, I met him. 
he still is a pastor, an old man, this guy. So he had lots of such testimonies that had filled his life. So I asked him, Pastor, uh, I have a request to you. He said, what? I said, can you please pray, lay hands on me and pray? He said, what do you want? He said, I need power. Okay. So he had me sit with him in prayer for half an hour. Then he asked me to pray. I prayed. Then he prayed and left. I felt no power. It was all the same. No power at all. And what it is? He didn't even lay his hand on me. So kind of I was disappointed. <laughs> but next morning I heard him. Brother Gilbert. Yes, Pastor. Shall we pray? Yes. So I just picked my Bible in my note- notebook and ran to him. I came in his living room and we sat on floor, spent about an hour just waiting upon the Lord. He had me pray, then he prayed. Okay, go. <laughs> there was nothing dramatic, no, nothing miraculous. But it, uh, very soon I realized that's his time to pray. So every day I would ra- uh, wake up early morning, not as early as today. <laughs> today I woke up at 1.30. <laughs> so I would wake up and uh, I would freshen up and uh, I would be praying and doing my quiet time, waiting for the hauler, Brother Gilbert. As soon as there was hauler, Brother Gilbert, yes, Pastor, I would just pick my Bible notebooks and run to him. And uh, we began to wait upon the Lord every day. And this time began to expand every other day. We ended up spending five to eight hours sitting in the presence of God, at the feet of God, just praying in tongues. And longer hours, just quiet. He journeyed me in the practice of waiting upon the Lord. As I say, Isaiah 40, 31. I experienced under his leadership and fellowship with him how to wait upon the Lord for long hours and as the days went by I felt a heavier presence of Holy Spirit I felt deeper intimacy with the Holy Spirit he became more and more real to me and several weeks went by. I told my leaders, hey guys, I need to have this morning till afternoon time for myself. I'll perform every responsibility that is due on me on the other time. So please don't disturb me on, uh, it, during this period. So I, I completely relieved myself, just dedicated to spend time with the Lord. And uh, several weeks went by. And one day we had, we sat in the presence of God in the morning. There was a very heavy anointing. It was so tangible in the room. You could almost cut a cube out of it. So tangible. And we were just two of us waiting upon the Lord. It was holy, holy moment. We spent about eight hours. We felt something was among us. Saw nobody. But later, for the first time, he lays his hands on me and prays very strong, very vibrant. I felt my head would crack. And he said, Father, the anointing and ministry and gifts you gave me, today I am part on this young man. But before that, he, he said one more thing. God is looking for people that are innocent as dove and fearless as lion. And then he prayed this prayer for me. It was such a heavy thing. I came back to my room and I tried to digest that presence. And that built in me something 
that you could not teach anyone in a classroom or can't learn by reading a book. My walk with the Lord was totally different. But before that, something else had happened. When I asked him to pray for me, before that, we had been evangelizing the whole area. And I had called my whole team back, 120 young guys, and do, did two days of review. In those two days of review, there were great testimonies God, the guys had to share. We reached 750,000 houses with a piece of John Gospel. But my eyes were only looking for the salvation results. Only two testimonies were shared for people being saved. After having reached 750,000 houses, you save only two people in months? That broke me. And out of that desperation, I, I was led to ask him to pray for me. And this happened. The journey happened. Now, I believed ministry, for me, ministry, rest of the life of ministry will be different. I came back to Delhi to start ministering. But something dramatic happened. I was driving a van and I had about 10 guys behind me all sleeping. We were driving for about a uh, thousand miles. And uh, I was a big program coordinator, this and that. Nice reputation. But all of a sudden, I'm led to go and evangelize this village. So I just uh, pull over. Stop. Look at the village. Holy Spirit is saying, go and evangelize. I'm starting your ministry today. So I said, hey guys, we are going to evangelize. What? We will evangelize this village. They were not even dressed properly, so they all dressed up. We all picked up books. That's what we knew until then. Go, go give people books. And they were all like uh, grumpy. Nobody was prepared. But I was led to do this. As I enter the village, I see a few people sitting in front of a hut. Uh, I reach out to them and pull out a piece of literature and offer. Uh, this is the word of God. So there was a woman, elderly woman said, My son, I'm illiterate. What this book will do to me? You're talking about God. My whole thigh is just in unbearable pain. You just relieve me of my pain. Heal me of my pain. Holy Spirit told me to lay hands and pray for her. But my rational told me, your team members are watching. And if you lay hands and pray, and if he is not healed, you will be a mockery. Uh, so I did not have faith to pray for that. <laughs> I said, you have somebody read this book to you, God will heal you. And I moved on. As I moved on, I had such a strong rebuke. You missed your chance. This was when your ministry was starting. You missed your chance. And I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I should have prayed for her healing. So sorry, Lord. Now I'll pray. Whoever comes before me, I'll pray for the person. As I was moving on with this fight inside of me, faithless uh, lack of faith and anointing of Holy Spirit, the mismatch of that, I heard a noise of village boys, children. I saw a bunch of children, they were pushing a tricycle. And this tricycle was uh, a wheelchair of uh, another uh, boy. He was, he, he was totally paralyzed. And they pushed him straight and brought him straight in front of me. 
they did not know who I was, who I was, what I was doing. And uh, I had just made a commitment to the Lord. Whoever comes to me, I will pray. And he came. I looked to him. When I looked at him, I saw his thighs were thinner than my arm. And apparently he could never stand on those thighs and legs. He was totally crippled, withered below the, below, below the waist. And Holy Spirit said, pray, heal him. <laughs> it was a lot easier to heal that other woman than this boy. And then I said, if I heal him, if I pray for him, and if he's not healed, not only my team members are going to make fun of me. These boys are really going to make, have a great day. They're going to enjoy having, making fun of me. And lo and behold, I was not able to pray for him. And turned back. And began to walk away from the village. I told guys, hey guys, let's go back. This is what it is. We stopped our journey. We started evangelizing the village. We were not uh, five minutes into it, and now we are going back. Uh, no, no, no. If, if we do this, we'll never reach Delhi. Let's go back. <laughs> uh, I made it up, and we all walked back to the van, and I began to drive. All the journey, my heart was crying, and I was weeping in my heart. Lord, I disobeyed you. I did not have faith. If I laid hands, in both cases, they would be healed. But it was my disobedience. And uh, after I came to Delhi, the Lord began to show me the faces of people living in slums, living in abject poverty. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Uh, living in abject poverty. And the Lord told me, this is going to be a field. And uh, I spent some more time. Meanwhile, I was married. And uh, as my wife was carrying, I resigned and walked into the slums, going in the streets, preaching the word of God, calling people forward, praying for them. There was revival on the streets, in the slums, every day and night. There was no time to get there, no time to come back home. Sometimes I would stay in those slums whole week long. And uh, people would be there all the time, needing to be prayed for. Demons were casted, sick were healed, all time. The moment there would be a message that I was there, crowds will roll in. And uh, there are people all over, wherever I went, there are people all over surrounding me, following me. And uh, as soon as any time I had opportunity, I would just preach the word, pray for the healing, preach the word, pray for the healing. Very soon, uh, I had lots of people all around living in, in abject poverty, almost having no material position. <clears throat> I spent one and a half years doing this. And then I wanted to draw the line and begin to preach the message of repentance, believe in Christ and obey in water. And nobody would follow this. Eventually, first 23 women came forward willing to be baptized. We had casted demons from thousands of people by this time. And after those women were baptized, it just began to snowball. People would be wanting to be baptized every day. People were baptized. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues all over in the slums in Delhi. And uh, one, one particular day, I was in fasting and praying with these slum guys. And they said, let's, let's do a big meeting. I said, let's do it. So we had no money. So they, they collected tiny coins from each other. And we made up little money. We rented a government uh, ground. And uh, uh, they went around everywhere telling people to come. 
because you're going to be healed. Thankfully, I did not hear what they were saying because they were making lots of commitments. And uh, I, had I known what the commitments they were making, I would be perplexed before uh, for preaching. So the first day I saw about 700 guys filling the ground. Uh, and tremendous healings and deliverances were done. Second day, this crowd just snowballed to about 5,000 people. And uh, we had many, many remark remarkable miracles all over. People had thrown their charms and armlets. And uh, we collected sacks full of those. Second day, I felt very strong, very heavy anointing. That night, I came back home. And uh, some of my uh, friends from other churches, they saw this. They said, here is Indian Billy Graham, uh, Indian Benny Hinn. I didn't know who Benny Hinn was. Next morning, I woke up, picked my Bible, went in the corner, tried to pray. And I felt zero presence of God. As if God had totally left me. I closed my eyes, tried to worship him, tried, tried to pray, worship him, and there was no God. Tried to read the Bible. It was only paper and book. The presence of Holy Spirit was zero. And uh, I tried to spend some time and the Lord was not there. Uh, I became desperate. Hour, two hours. There was zero presence of God. I felt like just leaving, stopping to pray. But I was very much worried. Something had gone wrong. I told my wife, uh, I just want to spend time. Uh, just go ahead. Don't bother me. And I closed my room and knelt down. I seriously began to seek the Lord. Lord, I'm willing to repent from any sin that I have committed. Please reveal to me my sin. Where are you, Lord? I need you. I was praying and praying and very desperate. Lord, I need you. Where are you? Why can't I have any sense of your presence right now? I don't know how long it went on. Until I had the voice of God. That still and small, small voice of God. I can use you for the rest of your life the way I used you last night. Or I can use the army that you put your life into. I immediately knew where the Lord was leading me. I repented and repented. I didn't want to be the star. I gave up myself. I said, Lord, I don't want to be the star. I give myself to pour my life into the army that you would raise, that you could use. And all of a sudden, I felt the same anointing back in heavier measure. And I had made a commitment. For the rest of my life, I would pour myself into others whom God could use. And till date, till today, I'm building that army. We have had over 60,000 people that are walking in anointing of Holy Spirit, casting out demons, praying for sick, leading them to Christ, running small groups, all over northern India, multiplying. And today I'm ready to go home because I know there's no power on planet that can stop this movement. I believe in the corporate ministry of preaching of the word of God. I believe in corporate ministry of evangelism. I believe in healings and deliverances and baptism of Holy Spirit. I believe in small groups. I believe in multiplication of a small group. No matter what it takes, whatever it takes to hit at the jaw of the devil and break his moral and release masses from his claws and clutch, 
Whatever it takes, I'm for it. Whatever. What counts is anointing breaks the yoke. And it is that anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which enables us to give glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. That kind of glory. I'm Gene Packwood for Wind and Fire in ARM Canada. Thanks for watching. Thank you.